delighted to welcome Jim Power, a lecturer at Michael Smurf Graduate School of Business, UCD. Uh, as an owner of an economic and financial research uh, consultancy, Jim provides a range of services, including public speaking, lecturing, media interviews, and commentary. During a career within the financial services industry, he has worked as Treasury econo econo Economist uh, at AIB and Chief Economist at Bank of Ireland Group Treasury. He is currently Chief Economist with Friends First Group, and Chairman of both Three Rock Capital Management and Love Irish Food. Jim, you're very welcome. You're going to give us, hopefully, hopefully, a positive economic outlook. Okay, um, thank you very much, Connor. Um, I, I can't promise the hopeful bit, but I'll give you a realistic assessment of where I, I see us at the moment. Um, I suppose, first of all, I'd like to thank the Sandyford Business District um, to invite me to speak at their Innovation Week. Delighted to do it. What I intend doing over the next 20 minutes, I'm going to look at the international, just, you know, what the... Um, the international environment is going to look like okay and um, then I am going to look at the domestic economic background what's happening there and then finally I want to bring it down to the local okay um, I think I'm getting a message that I'm a bit loud so I better okay is that better Okay, um, hopefully the sound level is better at that stage. I was getting a message that I was being too loud. As I say, I want to first of all look at the international, because um, obviously as a small open economy where international trade and where foreign direct investment is so important to the economy, um, what's happening the world economy you know, is, is very, very important. Um, 2019 was a challenging year for the world economy. Uh, we saw a significant slowdown everywhere, the United States, China. Um, coming into 2020, I certainly was more optimistic about the future because I believed that a hard Brexit would be avoided. I believed that Trump and his trade war with China would lose momentum ahead of the U.S. presidential election on the 3rd of November. And by the end of February, all of those things were happening. And certainly we were being set up for a better year ahead for the world economy. Not dramatic, but uh, a modest improvement in activity. And then, of course, everything changed in early March when we got the um, United Nations declaring a global pandemic. Um, we saw a dramatic impact on the world economy very, very quickly. Um, thankfully, we saw an incredibly quick, strong, coordinated global response. Interest rates were slashed everywhere. Um, central banks engaged in quantitative easing, pumping money into the global financial system with the sole aim, really, of keeping government bond yields down. And that facilitated the other part of the global response, which was fiscal policy, in other words, governments. And we've seen all over the world, and we saw a prime example of it in Ireland last Tuesday, well, Tuesday week now, with the annual budget. Um, basically, the European Union has cast aside fiscal rules which limit borrowing. They have cast aside state aid rules and they have basically encouraged all member countries to engage in significant fiscal expansion. So cut taxes where possible, but more particularly increase government spending dramatically. So as I say, we've seen um, this very strong global response. All governments are borrowing and spending around the world, particularly in the European Union. Interest rates will remain and will have to remain at rock bottom levels for the foreseeable future. You know, as the global economy reopened from sort of April, May onwards, we saw a very strong rebound in economic activity everywhere. But of course, um, it's now starting to be undermined again by the recurrence of the virus. Um, many countries around the world, including ourselves, are having to put back in place significant restrictions on business activity, on economic activity, and of course, on social activity. So, you know, obviously, uh, the, the challenge for the world economy the next 12, 18 months is going to be determined by the path of the virus. And really, until 
um, either a safe and effective vaccine is delivered or until um, we get medicinal treatment of the virus. You know, obviously, it, it is going to have a significant impact on global economic activity. Another issue is the US election on the 3rd of November. Um, I, I could talk about that for the next 20 minutes. I better not. But I think suffice to say that Biden victory would be better for Ireland from a number of reasons. One, this very confrontational global trade approach that Trump had, has, excuse me, does not suit a small open economy like Ireland. And the second piece is the corporation tax one. Biden has said he would increase the corporation tax rate in the States from 21 to 28 percent. That, of course, makes Ireland a more attractive location for um, U.S. foreign direct investment in Europe. So um, the next couple of weeks will be incredibly interesting in that regard. Uh, Brexit is obviously a significant major source of uncertainty at the moment. And um, I will talk about that more in this, this slide, actually. As you know, the UK left the European Union on the 31st of January, went into a transition period, which ends on the 31st of December. During that transition period, the UK is still maintaining all of the same economic and trading relationships with the European Union, although it is not a member of the EU formally. And this transition period was put in place to facilitate um, the negotiations of a future trading arrangement between the United Kingdom and the European Union. Um, October 15th, um, which is a week ago at this stage almost, was a key date in the sense that Boris Johnson had said some time back that if a deal had not been agreed by 15th of October, well, then Britain would walk away from the transition mechanism without a deal. And on the 1st of January next, World Trade Organization um, trade tariffs would apply to trade between the European Union and the United Kingdom. And obviously, as part of the, United, as part of the European Union between Ireland and um, the UK, uh, the mood music out of the negotiations has been pretty negative really since they began back in April. Um, there is still a significant risk that Britain will exit on the 31st of December and that WTO tariffs would apply from the following day. Um, I have always believed and I continue to believe, uh, perhaps foolishly or naively at this stage, but I still believe it, that we will get some sort of deal at the end of the day. It'll be a watered-down compromise, but it would avoid Britain um, entering into WTO trading arrangements. Uh, that is obviously the sort of outcome Ireland desires at this juncture. But whether we get, okay, WTO trade tariffs would represent the worst outcome, but um, even if a deal is done, you'd, you'd still have to think that the, well, sorry, I don't think, it's, I think it's a fact that Ireland's trading relationship with the UK for business will definitely become more complicated. The sector of the Irish economy most exposed is the agri-food sector. Okay, so um, moving on to what has happened to the Irish economy, you know, we've, we've obviously seen a dramatic decline in economic activity after March as large swathes of our economy were shut down. The Irish government, facilitated by the European Union, um, sorry, I skipped forward there, OK, uh, the, the Irish government, um, along with the European Union, is accepting that higher deficits, budget deficits, will have to be run for the foreseeable future. And I suppose a sense of consolation for Ireland is that we are not alone. What we did in the budget last week is what every country in Europe is doing at the moment and indeed around the world. They're spending lots of money to protect their, their businesses, their households from the ravages of COVID-19. And, um, you know, there's an acceptance that that's going to have to continue for the foreseeable future. And I think there's also an acceptance and indeed the International Monetary Fund has accepted this in recent times that fiscal austerity cannot follow this that the most important thing now is to try and rebuild our economy to make sure as many businesses as possible survive so as that when we do come out the other end of this COVID crisis, whenever that will be, that we will have um, a strong business sector, that we will have 
financially viable households and so on. And thankfully, from an Irish perspective, um, there is no problem running the sorts of deficits we're running because our international credibility is good and um, we're able to borrow at very, very low rates of interest, which is facilitated by the European Central Bank's quantitative easing program. Um, I think an important factor is that in the last 12 months, we've seen, particularly in the first half of this year, we've seen a pretty dramatic increase in household deposits in the first six months of the year, up by almost $8 billion to a record high of $112 billion almost. That's, there's an element of precautionary saving there, but there's also an element of people who are still earning lots of money. There's many sectors of the economy still doing very well. Um, the, the wherewithal to spend money is obviously very, very limited. So there is this buildup of deposits, which eventually, once we come back to some sort of normality, that money will come back into the economy. So there will be, in my view, a significant consumer rebound um, once consumers have the ability to do that. Another thing that's become very clear this year is that the foreign direct investment base, particularly the chemical and pharmaceutical sector, um, is proving an incredibly important anchor for the economy at the moment, both in terms of the export performance and more particularly in terms of the strong growth in corporation tax receipts. And it is that strong growth in corporation tax receipts that's obviously facilitating the sort of budget we saw last week. Um, unfortunately, you know, over and we're, we're seeing it this week, the recovery for the foreseeable future, will be determined by health fundamentals um, and restrictions will remain a fact of life until the vaccine and or medicinal treatment is, um, is it happens. Okay, um, I have to say, and I, I'm sure in the Q&A at the end of this uh, afternoon, um, I am pretty critical of the very, very blanket approach that was taken to the move to level five. I think there was no attempt made to assess different levels of risks in different activities. Um, but the decision has been taken and we'll have to live with it for at least the next six weeks, which I think um, is unfortunate. This is what's happening in the labor market front. You can see out there on the extreme right hand side, you know, we're starting to see the impact of COVID-19 uh, in terms of the labour market. This is a sectoral breakdown of employment changes between the first and the second quarter. Um, and you can see the sectors that are most adversely affected. It's wholesale and retail trade. It's accommodation and food services. Sectors like that, administrative and support services, these sectors that are actually consumer-facing businesses, they are the ones most adversely affected. Um, this is the breakdown of the export performance in the first eight months. And the thing that stands out there is the chemical and pharmaceutical sector. 66% of our total merchandise exports growing very strongly. And as I say, that's providing a very solid anchor for the Irish economy and the public finances. And of course, some of those chemical and pharma companies operate within the um, Sandyford Business District. So it's, it's, it's very, very that FDI piece is really, really important for the economy at the moment. This is a breakdown of tax revenues in the first nine months. And there's a couple of things I want to say. One is corporation tax receipts growing very strongly, up by almost 28%. The other piece is the fact that income tax has declined by just 2.1%. Given the devastation that's been wreaked on the labor market since March, you would have expected income tax receipts to be significantly weaker, but they're holding up remarkably well. And that's because sectors of the economy like foreign direct investment, um, the financial services sector, the public sector, which got a pay increase of 2% on the 1st of October, and professional services, a lot of areas of the economy where the bulk of income tax paid um, are still doing very well in terms of earnings. And of course, that's feeding into what I said a few minutes back about the growth in household deposits. So, um, and, and of course, what that means is that those workers who are most exposed to this crisis are in the accommodation and food services sector, in the retail sector, where wages tend to be lower. And because of our very progressive tax system, you know, they pay a lot less income tax. So hence, we, we very much at the moment have this dual economy 
large segments were doing very, very well. And then obviously large segments in significant difficulty that have been compounded by um, what has happened in the last 24 hours with the move to level five. This is household debt. Um, you can see, you know, a pretty remarkable downward trend. Households have been repairing their balance sheet since 2012, 2013. That's good. This is the household deposits bit, and that pink line shows you the strong growth in household deposits over the last 12 months. That, as I say, will eventually um, materialize in a strong rebound in pent-up demand in the economy, um, which is certainly something um, that we should feel um, welcome about. And this is just some of, the, sorry, these are some of the statistics on that. You can see household finances um, very healthy, household deposits growing strongly, household debt falling quite sharply. So that does, as I say, set us up for a strong rebound at some stage. Um, so looking at the Irish recovery issues at a national level, okay, um, the economy, you know, started to reopen basically from May onwards, and we saw a significant rebound in economic activity. Um, some sectors obviously didn't share the same sort of rebound because consumer facing businesses were still having to operate in an environment where health protocols were very, very strong and where capacity of businesses was reduced considerably. Okay. Um, and of course, then in the last number of weeks, we've seen infection rates rise. We've seen the move back to level five and all of that. So that, that's a problem. Consumers have not lost the spending habit and have no doubt that given the opportunity, you know, consumer spending will come back into the system pretty, pretty quickly. Um, the FDI export base is incredibly important to the economy at the moment. FDI employs 245,000 people directly. There's another 200,000 people almost indirectly supported by those jobs. So the FDI thing is really, really good for Ireland at the moment. The agri-food sector doing okay, but it's, it's a challenging environment. Obviously, the biggest challenge it now faces is um, on, the, on the Brexit front, but also the food services business are under pressure, you know, with restaurants closed, with staff canteens closed, that segment of the agri-food market is gone. So those companies that sell through the retail sector are doing okay. The prospects for international tourism obviously remain very challenging until people are able and willing to fly again. Um, and for the Irish economy, that really, really is a serious hit, given that last year we had 10.8 million visitors into the country from overseas, which was a record high. It's clear that COVID-19 support will be required for the foreseeable future for at least the next 18 months. Housing, big issue for government. Health is a big issue for government. They will remain, and, and they, they did feature strongly in the budget last week. And I suppose uh, Brexit, as I've said, still poses a significant threat to um, the Irish economy. But I'm pretty optimistic about that in the sense that I think we will get some sort of deal. Uh, but, you know, whatever way you look at it, you, can, you can't um, gild the lily here. Um, it's, it's a challenging environment. You know, COVID-19 just represents an absolutely dramatic shock to the economy. And it is going to take some time to return to what we would regard as a more normal level of activity. So I have a level of optimism, but I think we also have to be quite realistic. These are the economic assumptions underlying the budget last week. Um, and I'm not going to bore you with statistics today, but suffice to say, you know, significant weakness in the domestic economy in 2020, um, a modest rebound expect for 21. And the, the two key assumptions underlying that budget was that, number one, a vaccine would not be delivered during 2021. And secondly, there would be a hard Brexit. You know, hopefully, both of those will prove wrong and that the economic rebound will be stronger. But the caveat there, of course, is that um, in the final quarter of this year, activity is obviously going to be constrained by the fact that we've moved back into level five. Um, so the priority in the budget was obviously to support those businesses, those households most affected by um, COVID-19. And of course, there was also 
a significant priority given to uh, the challenges posed by Brexit. And the other three areas that dominated the budget last week, and this reflects the formation of the government we saw back in July, health, housing, climate change, are the three big national issues at this juncture. If you ignore COVID-19 and Brexit, that's where um, we're going to be devoting most official attention for the foreseeable future as in years to come. And we saw last week, you know, a significant government investment in um, social and affordable housing, particularly. So, um, an incredible budget in a sense that, you know, a massive expenditure package, you know, there's no doubt about that. Um, We got a 17.4 billion increase in expenditure and just 270 million in next net tax changes. Um, and, and that reflects, sorry, that was the, the VAT rate cut for the hospitality sector from 13.5% to 9% was the main thing that was done on the tax side. Uh, the capital budget, 10.1 billion, which is the highest capital budget ever um, introduced in this country. And I think that is wholly and totally appropriate because we do need to invest in physical infrastructure capital spending. I think that's really important for the longer term of the economy. Um, And I suppose the other bit of the budget that stands out was obviously uh, the funding that was directed towards um, dealing with COVID-19 and with Brexit. And a lot of it, that spending is conditional on what happens in both of those areas during 2021. Um, So I, I think broadly speaking, you know, the budget was totally appropriate for an economy facing the challenges that Ireland is facing at the moment. Two sectors, um, I think, could justifiably feel aggrieved after the budget. One is the motor industry um, with the changes in VRT rates for climate reasons. Um, You know, those price increases for many cars will come at a time that, you know, the motor industry has come through five very, very difficult years. So the last thing in the world that sector required at this stage um, was an increase in the price of any vehicles. Um, so, but but clearly that's the future. You know that is the environmental agenda. And then there was nothing in there for the airline industry. Uh, but for most other sectors, certainly um, it was um, a decent budget. Now, looking at the the future nationally, and I suppose for the Sandyford Business District, um, COVID nineteen will is and will continue to, you know, have fundamental implications for um, the Irish economy and indeed for the whole Sandyford business district. Okay, there's there's a lot of different ways it's impacting. Obviously, many of the businesses in that district have been very adversely affected by what has happened since March. Other businesses within the district um, have, you know, continued to perform very, very strongly. And I just reiterate the point I made earlier in my presentation that this dual nature of the economy, you know, is is, is incredibly obvious at this stage. And, and, you know, economically, and I think socially, we are seeing massive um, increases in inequality again. And I think that's going to be a big issue that the government is going to have to deal with in the aftermath of this. But, but also, um, this is a global issue. It's, it's not unique to Ireland. Remote working has become obviously a feature of the environment. Um, does this mean that the office is dead? No, it's not. I mean, I think once we come out of this, the working environment will be different. Some people will want to work from home. Others will want to work in the office and others will like a hybrid model. So I think there's going to be a much greater element of flexibility built into the system. Okay, but definitely a lot of business have discovered actually that remote working does work and, and it is for employers. Um, I think they are going to have to build in that level of flexibility for workers where appropriate, obviously, because there are some businesses where remote working simply doesn't work. But I think there's going to be have to be a much more flexible approach to that. What does it mean for office space? Does it mean we're going to see thousands of vacant office spaces around uh, the city. Um, I I actually don't think so. 
I still think the demand for office space, you know, at the end of all of this will be strong, but something we need to keep an eye on. Uh, working from home. And I also think that enterprise hubs, you know, of uh, of the variety we have in Dunleary, for example, these could become, I think, an incredibly important part of the future economic model. Of course, technology is the crucial enabler of all of this, you know, and hence at a company level, at a national level, investment in technology, investment in technological capability, investment in broadband, et cetera, you know, has to be a local and a national priority because it is going to become an increasingly important driver of the future. Um, bricks and mortar retail, obviously under significant pressure, and those pressures have been exacerbated by the move to level five. Uh, it's definitely a challenging future. You know, we're seeing a remarkable move to online. And you could certainly say that this whole long-term trend that's been evident in the retail sector for the last 10 years at least, um, the move towards remote shopping, um, probably got pushed forward five years in the space of six months since March. So s huge challenges there for the retail sector to respond to this. Um, and, you know, for... Uh, the Sandyford Business District, you know, I think that's a significant issue. The hospitality sector, likewise, you know, lots of hospitality businesses in serious trouble. They're getting a lot of support, but many will quite simply disappear. So I hope not, but that's the reality. You would hope that you will see new businesses starting to take their place. And I think for the local authority, um, the local authority will be a key enabler of this process of creative destruction. And I suppose the other point about nationally and for the Sandyford Business uh, District, you know, the environmental agenda is, is going to be absolutely crucial for the foreseeable future, I think is going to, more than anything else, drive the development of the area um, and, and as it should as far forward as we can realistically see, you know, it's, it's up there as probably top of the longer term agenda. Once we get through things like COVID-19 and Brexit, which I hope we will um, pretty quickly. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, skip through a lot of stuff pretty quickly. Thank you for your attention. And um, I will be back in the panel session later on. So if you have any queries, questions or fundamental disagreements with what I've been saying, um, I'd be delighted to handle that later on. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Uh, thank you, Jim Power. Um, I wasn't entirely sure how I was going to feel after your presentation, but I'm still upbeat. I still remain positive, and I'm delighted uh, that you're predicting modest growth in uh, 2021. I know there's some caveat.